I'm sorry, I, I don't really know where to begin because it's been about 12, 14 years maybe that I knew a boss and I actually we were supposed to be doing some sort of a project or a seminar. Last time we saw each other we said we'll be together again in um, February 2017. We were thinking of that. Um, and over the past uh, 12 or 14 years we've We've um, met in different places around the world, Paris, New York, um, Marrakesh a lot. In Marrakesh, he'd have me come to some of these uh, student uh, gatherings that he had or, or seminars and then play, have me speak and then play tricks on me. I, you know. <laughs> um, uh, in a way, in my mind, you know, I'm still prepping for the meeting next year. I guess it's what happens with a a great loss when I mean, you fall into the habit of thinking that someone's always going to be there always in the future then the fact that their absence that they are absent it hits you hard and it keeps coming back it won't go the impact has been so strong and I know I'll be thinking of Abbas in this way for some time as I uh, for some time to come and I know you will be too I'm um, simply I you know, I consider, uh, it's a weird thing, but like, it's, uh, I'm 73. He was a friend, he became a friend. Um, last time I saw him was in Lyon in October. It was Helen and I, my wife, and we're in a hotel. And uh, he wanted to show me, before he left, he wanted to show me these uh, 24 frames, which was wild on a computer. And if many of you haven't seen this stuff yet, maybe you must have, I'm not quite sure but they are remarkable and he said i know you have not much time you must get rest i said no it's all right no oh, no i want to see how many each one is four minutes you know and uh the first i saw was the uh andrew wyatt uh christina's world and i talked about king vidor and king vidor is the um the big parade that uh, um, uh andrew wyatt was inspired by the hill and the big parade when john gilbert comes back from the war all of this that inspired the paintings of, of uh, Wyatt and um, the Van Gogh all of this stuff and uh, uh, that was it that was I said I'll see you see you next year we'll work this out um, uh, and that was the last time I saw him um, I'd like to talk about the first time I met him which was at Cannes um, it was a, I was the president of a jury uh, what is it the Cine Fondation which is for student films, right? I don't forget, I forget the year, but it was the first time I met him. I think it was uh, maybe 12 or 13 years ago. And I, um, I had seen by that time, over a period of a couple of years, four or five of his pictures, starting, you know, the trilogy, the um, olive trees, all of that. Uh, but I hadn't seen close up yet. Now, at an early age in my life, I was about five or six, when I um, saw, I was exposed to Italian neorealist films, 1947, 48, whatever. And for many reasons, I, I was shocked by these films, by the purity and by the truth of the Italian cinema that I saw there, Open City, Paisa, Shoeshine, Bicycle Thieves. And I know Abbas loved these films too, I believe. Now, the interesting thing is after I saw four or five of his films together, over a period of a few months, I found that um, I experienced that same impact 65 years later. That it was something that re, just completely, I don't know, just changed my way of looking at the world. And, you know, now I'm the president of this jury, he's, he's on the jury, it was one of the nice people on the jury. And, um, you know, because of the impact that these films had on me, I was a little cautious to meet him. I mean, you know, uh, we finally get together and say hello, and the whole group together, and I see this guy, he's cool. <laughs> he's got those glasses on, you know. <laughs> Didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm saying, hmm, all right. Um, you know, elegant, eloquent, uh, very quiet, very careful with his words, you know. Always thoughtful and always studying everything, but it wasn't it wasn't cold. There was some other thing going on. I said, what the heck is this? So <laughs> we spent the first day, I forget how many days we had of looking at these films. Uh, we spent the first day looking 
and quite honestly, I, I, you know, I, I was in the middle of my own morass and making pictures and there's lots of pressure and that sort of thing. We're the carousel of Cannes, all that madness, New York, LA. And uh, at the end of the first day, they all suggest that we get together and maybe I give some guidelines for the jury as to how to proceed as to what we think would be a good film or not, et cetera, et cetera. And I did that, but I was really, in, I really had no idea. I just really had no idea what a criteria of judging, in the first place, judge a film is a problem. Now, judging student films, 20 a day, I, I, you know, I just simply, I didn't really know, and I, I, I babbled on for a little while. And I said, you know what, why don't we please give me to the morning? Let me see another group of this, these films to lunchtime tomorrow. Then maybe I'll get my head together in terms of, in terms of, um, oh, just the, the jet lag, everything. And then, and uh, he was sitting there, and then he said, "May I say something?" I said, "Of course." He said, "Can I suggest that today many short films are made merely as examples of a story that the filmmaker wants to get to make into a feature?" in the commercial world. He said, what if, what if we just experience these films as films, in and of themselves, not made with any agenda? And I said, well, that's the man. That's the guy. I said, you got it. That's the way to go. You're right. You're right. I said, yeah, for me, you know, he, what he was talking about really is the film itself, the experience itself, the film in and of itself, contingent on nothing but itself, has to stand on its own. And this was actually the kind of thinking and the way of seeing the world that I needed. And not only in, in cinema, but in my life, really. And um, I mean, <laughs> What put us in the room in the first place was our love of cinema. We're not there to have, you know, I mean, to judge something for three days. It's not easy. It's, it's not a, a pleasant task. But we had, uh, it was an extraordinarily difficult time. But our love of cinema is what put us in the room in the first place. Our love of film and our love of movies. And what does it mean to love movies, uh, to love cinema? You know, there, okay, there are camera movements, there's editing, there's non-editing, um, angles, style, spectacle. And I guess, to a certain extent, that's all true. You take that into consideration. But all these things add a certain, they add to a certain love of cinema, right? But technique and technical sophistication affects us only to the extent that they help work to create simple, direct contact between the filmmaker and the audience. Um, really, because for us, the people who make film who love film, cinema's life. And when I see Kiristami's films, when I see The Olive Trees, when I see ABC Africa, or Where is the Home of My Friend, or The, the Wind Will Carry Us, or any of these pictures, the last section of five, the, the, the fifth episode, I think, uh, I mean, I found that purity again. I, I found that I, I, you know, I found that I wanted to spend the time with the people in these films. It was like a cleansing to spend time with the spirit of those films, those worlds, the spirit of the artistry which makes me see people in the world in a new, refreshing, and hopeful way. Yeah. Simplicity, we talk about simplicity with uh, Kiristami, of course, of us, but purity being the key, but it's not easy. You know, many of Abbas's speeches are uh, com complex. Taste of Cherry is very complex, and Certified Copy, which is a beauty, uh, is certainly complex. Um, but they're, they're, they're there to be peeled away to get to the essential core at the center. And I'm thinking of close-up. I've been thinking of close-up since I've seen it after that festival, you know? uh, which, by the way, we had a great time at. Became very good friends. Um, I'm thinking of Sabziang. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. In close-up, when he's speaking before the court about why he pretended to be Moshe Makmapov. Quote, they gave me their attention. He's talking about the family now that he deceived. They gave me their attention and respect, he says of the family. Quote, because of my passion for cinema, and above all, because they respected me and supported me morally, I really got into the part. It encouraged me to play the role better, 
to where I even felt I was a director. I really was. But when I leave and I head back home, I have to shed the character, unquote. You know, what he couldn't do in his everyday life, the life of a poor guy who couldn't even afford to buy his kids some treats, um, he could do that in the role of Makmalath. And that is interact one-on-one -on -one with the members of the family without being judged or condescended to or ignored altogether through the experience of cinema, creating cinema, even without filming the camera. He exists and he matters. You know, why did he have to play the role of a director? Well, it could have been a businessman, but it's not about money. It's not about money. It's about mutual respect. It's about humanity. Um, and it's really the cinema that's inspired him. It's maybe a definition of cinema itself. Maybe it's the reason why we create, to matter, to exist. So I'm so moved by this. I was so moved by that film. That was a, a complete uh, change in terms of uh, seeing the world again. I know I'm repeating myself, but it really is an extraordinary film. And I recommend it over the years and shown it at festivals. Or, um, I've looked at it again recently, before, right before this tragedy. Um, right, and then, you know, I, I, I've seen it many times. I'm thinking about it many times since we had the shocking, devastating news of this great artist's death. But when I think of Abbas's work, it is the cinema which ties us all together. And his cinema, Abbas's, for me is a form of worship. It's an act of faith. So rest. <laughs>